Let's get started. Um, so, you know, I I read um, Elizabeth and Kathleen. I read your stories. I really enjoyed them, first of all, and I, I read them with a lot of interest, and um, both in, in sort of different ways uh, unsettled me a little bit. Um, just sort of imagining a future of that kind of um, real cognitive change. And so I guess, you know, my, my first question, um, my, my first question for you two is, uh, Elizabeth, you give a story of sort of neuroscience used to control um, and, and, and sort of shape human minds for the sake of, um, you know, ostensibly protecting people. Um, and Kathleen, you give us one of neuroscience used to really create human flourishing um, and, and push a path forward. And, and to me, those can be two sides of the same coin. They can coexist. Um, Absolutely. And I, I was wondering if you two also saw it that way, that you can sort of imagine a future where we're using, these, using this technology to, to enhance the human mind in beneficial ways, but also to con constrict it in ways that we may tell ourselves are for the good, but you know, may or may not be. Um, I, I will uh, start by giving an example. Um, in one of my former careers, I was a Montessori teacher, and I had my own school. Uh, one day, probably in 1983, a mother came in and um, said that her doctor had recommended that she give her perfectly normal, to me, four-year-old Ritalin. And I said, have you really thought this through? Because I thought it was a really bad thing to be giving drugs to children that young. Um, he was a little, you know, wild at times, but all children are. Uh, and, uh, but she went ahead and did it. And I saw a great transformation for the good, and I realized that the drug was settling his brain down enough so that he could, uh, could actually start to learn how to read and, and to function in the environment in what, in, in, that he was in simply because his uh, uh, sensory signals uh, previously to, previous to the Ritalin were not uh, getting through in a uh, predictable way. And that was what was you know, making him so uh, hyperactive basically. So uh, at that point, you know, I learned something about a, uh, a neurotechnology, so to speak, and, uh, you know, how it could be used for good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I can see all kinds of ways that it could be uh, used for um, uh, unsavory purposes, especially if it were not uh, the choice especially if it could not be uh, if further controlled by uh, the user. Uh, in other words, if someone decided that everybody needs this particular drug and that we ought to take it and that it's in the water, uh, yeah, that, that's not a good thing. And it could be easy to do. I, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in violent agreement. Um, I don't think that there is any form of practical practical neurology, I think was the term we were using on the on the uh, hieroglyph message boards, um, that isn't a double-edged sword. I don't think there is any way to um, start externally fine-tuning the human brain that doesn't have profound cultural implications for good and, and for ill. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about in creating my story is the, the history of mental health um, in the Western world, dating back, even say from, from the 1850s when we started to have modern conceptions of um, humane treatment of the mentally ill and attempting to find cures. But those same, those same structures, which in some ways had the best of intentions behind them, have also been used as tremendous engines of social control and oppression. Um, uh, social justice activists, homosexuals, uh, suffragettes, any any of these women, uh, w women and other you know people who were trying to step outside of their socially constrained roles would find themselves declared mad and sent off to asylums where they were tortured into submission, more or less. Um, we talk about 
valuable anti-anxiety drugs like Valium, which were used as a, strongly as an instrument of social control in the 1950s. You're unhappy at home, oh, we'll give you Valium. You know, that's not addressing the problem. On the other hand, if you have anxiety about getting on an airplane, maybe that's what you need. Uh, so, you know, just, just to reduce it to the, to the very crude level of technology that was available 60 years ago. And when you start contemplating the sorts of hacks we can perform upon the human brain now, and the, the real subtlety of knowledge we're obtaining about how brains work and how personality and, and creativity work, um, it, is, it is both scary and exhilarating simultaneously. Uh, Jonathan, do you have any, have any thoughts on this? Well, uh, maybe a comment about uh, known unknowns. Uh, each of these two edges has another couple of edges. Yes. So um, we're glad that the little boy did better on Ritalin. On the other hand, because it's so hard for ethical as well as practical reasons and financial reasons to do lar a large-scale clinical trial, uh, we don't know whether he would have done as well on caffeine, which some people prescribe to kids who are uh, ADHD first. And we don't know how, how old was he? He was four. Oh, well, so we don't know how in the next two or three years he would have adapted. It's well known the little boys, for the most part, don't do well in classroom, structured classrooms. Little girls tend to do better. Uh, and we also don't know, since I teach people at, at Penn who have been on uh, Ritalin in some cases already for 10 years or more, they're going to be on it perhaps for 20, 30, or 40 years or more, or, uh, or uh, antidepressants like Zoloft. This is a big public health experiment. So we don't know what's going to happen with these people. And you know, it's a reason, although I'm, we're glad he did better, uh, I wouldn't have wanted it for my four-year-old, I have to say. But uh, you know, we, there is a certain amount of priority that parents have over their kids. I understand that. Uh, asylums are very interesting. I'm also interested in the history of asylums. Um, so you walk out on the street, and it's what, what Elizabeth says about asylums are, of course, true. There were Packard laws in the late 19th century named after a woman who was found uh, insane by a jury in Ohio. Uh, and uh, she was insane because she wanted to leave her husband. Um, so uh, the, Packard <laughs> laws, the Packard laws were very powerful for many years, and indeed many people uh, in this country and, of course, in the old Soviet Union, psychiatry has been and may in some parts of the world still be used to oppress people. On the other hand, uh, we go on the street and we see people who really need to be in an asylum. Yeah. Uh, an asylum is a good thing. It's become pejorative, uh, but it's actually a good thing for people who really need to be protected and cared for properly. So. There are a couple of edges for each of these double edges. So how do we, you know, how do we begin? We, we hopefully we know as a as a collective as a society like the history of these things, right? And that's maybe a bit of wishful thinking, but I'd like to think that the people the historians are still arguing about the history, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and so knowing what we know about the past and knowing how, um, you know, neuroscience uh, and sort of, I mean, really, it's the entire history of science has been used used to oppress people, um, how are, are we, are people working on these advances right now sort of actively grappling with um, some of the, the negative potential here? Are they actively trying to, you know, create a language um, for the future of like, dealing with the ethical consequences of what they're working on? What's that for me? So, um, <laughs> That's for everyone. I, uh, well, you get to go first. So can I, you get to do that? Uh, so, um, when I first started getting interested in particular about a dozen years ago in ethics and neuroscience especially, I, I did find it hard to get a conversation going with uh, my friends and colleagues who are scientists. I'm not. Uh, uh, and people in neuroscience generally didn't, weren't interested in talking about the ethical issues, and that was true. And there are people in this room who know this well because they themselves have worked on these questions. Uh, I think that has changed for a lot of reasons in the last eight years. A lot more conversation about it in this building. I've been part of a couple of uh, uh, national Research Council committees that have to do with national security and neuroscience, which has really forced the issues uh, more and more into the open. So I think there is a greater appreciation of ethical issues in neuroscience now than there was a dozen or 14 years ago. Um, but we, and, and many of those issues are not new. So I mentioned drug testing, for example. We had a lot of experience with drug testing. It's not new to neuroscience. Uh, some of the cognitive enhancement issues are a little new. Um, but a lot of that is, is driven by the particular technology, drug or device you're talking about. But I think there's an openness increasingly, more than there was a dozen years ago, to talking about ethical, social, legal issues in neuroscience among the neuroscientists themselves. As, as, uh, as you had mentioned, um, it, it is hard to 
construct a long-term good study on human beings, and, and it's, they're, they're often unethical. And, and, um, and as far as good goes, it, I think most studies are probably bad for one reason or another. Uh, so uh, that is, you know, um, not well set up. And so, so it doesn't really yield the information that you want and need. Uh, but uh, but one, of, one of the issues of ethics that uh, concerns me is the fact that we, we test so many, uh, so many of our drugs uh, on animals, and uh, what, are the, uh, what are the ethics of that? Uh, there are a lot of uh, animal ethics groups, and the more that we learn about animals, the more we understand that this is a very, very bad thing. Uh, and, and so I, I realize that a lot of good comes out of this kind of testing. Uh, you know, the death of billions of rats has led to a lot of what we know today about how our senses work. Uh, and yet, um, you know, at, at what point does that come, become seriously troubling to the society that we live in? Uh, I think that uh, chimps are no longer to be used for, uh, for any kind of studies at all. Uh, that, that took place last summer, and that was in, in the United States anyway, and that's a very good thing. Uh, There's a little wiggle room, though, in that, uh, in that policy. If it, if it, for example, if you couldn't test uh, an Ebola drug uh, on a human being first for various ethical reasons, you can still go to chimps because it's a, such a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a little wiggle room, but in general, what you say is tr true. And then the interesting question is, how, f how far along in the evolutionary chain does that go? Is that the camel's nose? And that's what, uh, under the tent, as it were, and a lot of people in science are concerned about that. But also, it's also true that primates are really expensive and hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, you know, and none le more difficult to deal with than yes, we are, especially humans. difficult to deal with. Uh, so they're probably not a big, a big uh, area. But I think it is an interesting question about how far down the, the chain of sort of suffering in evolution are we going to go. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to me that there's, a, there's an entire uh, symposiums worth of, uh, not even a, a panel, but yeah. worth of ethical questions here that, that interlock. Um, you know, what are the ethical consequences of refusing to treat people who, who could be helped? Uh, what are the ethical consequences of forcing treatment upon neurally atypical people who don't want it? Uh, Elizabeth Moon has a fantastic book about this very topic, uh, Speed of Dark. Um, uh, there are issues of bodily integrity. There are uh, issues of civil rights. Um, there's also the, the issue of, you know, I, I hate to sound fluffy, but I'm going to, the issue of, of personal growth. You know, the, the kid in your class, possibly in a year or two, he would have developed the skills to exert that control on and, and focus himself. Um, and the, the question of, you know, where we, where we stop teaching cognitive skills and start going immediately to drugs is a really profound and complicated one. Um, sort of on the, along the lines of, you know, when, when is it acceptable, or when, when, when can you sort of essentially mandate the use of these things, the use of these sort of technologies on people? I know, um, Kathleen, in your story, part of the, you know, in the in the backstory to our future world of universal literacy, there's lots of upheaval over this idea that, you know, um, I, I think the protesters uh, you write say like, don't, you know. Don't force my child to take this drug. Like, don't don't force my child to do this and that. Um, yeah. Do you, you know, where do you, in this for, for a drug that results in universal literacy, literacy something that's unquestionably good for the for an individual. I mean, where do you fall on this? If if it's something that is um, so powerful and has so much potential for good, um, should should it be something that we, you know, strongly say you got to do this, like vaccines? Yes, and, and, and of course not, as things stand now. Um, and uh, because the, the drug or whatever, the, the intervention in my story, which uh, purports to, uh, to help people with dyslexia uh, read, um, is, is a magic bullet that, that doesn't exist. Because uh, dyslexia is a, um, is a spectrum mm -hmm. of differently brained people, and who is to say that these different brains uh, are not, you know, their own mm -hmm. 
that they can modify uh, as they wish. So, um, the um, so so yeah, there there would be parents who would want their child to have that drug, and then there would be parents who would not want their child to be to have that drug, and there are people who would and wouldn't. And uh, of course, I think that it should be a matter of choice. But but in, in something like that, if you if you think of See, literacy is, is much different than uh, a, a vaccine for smallpox. Yeah. The, you know, a certain amount of people might get sick or die from a vaccine, especially, you know, from the polio vaccine uh, when it first came out. What was the, the Salk vaccine or the, the other one? Anyway, yeah, the Sabin vaccine. And um, uh, so, so in, in, the, uh, in the event that... Uh, it may not be, you know, good for some people. Of course, of course, you can't do that. So I, I think that, um, and 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 there's also the fact that literacy is a very, very powerful thing, yeah. and I th I think that it would cause huge revolutions in the world. It would cause uh, a lot of change when people can get more information about the world in 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 more mediums than are now available. Uh, I think. I, I prefer to read than watch videos because I can read really quickly. I can only watch videos at maybe four times the speed that they're made. So I can, I can take in information much more quickly with reading. And, and I, I, I can access a, a, a greater variety in the, in the distant past uh, of what people thought and said. So I think it's a powerful to, tool for, for, for revolution. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so the, yeah, the, those are some of the issues that, yeah. that I think of yeah. in, in that respect. We, uh, we, we feel okay with compelling education and military service ostensibly for the, for the greater good of civilization. I mean, we feel okay societally. Many of us have differing opinions on this. Um, where, do you, where do you draw the line in, well, okay, um, I've got a process that can uh, remove sociopathic tendencies. Um, well, there goes Wall Street, but that's a different problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, what, what, where do I draw the line in applying that process? Can I have the courts remand criminals to this procedure to, you know, reform them or make them productive members of society? Uh, save on the, the um, save a little money on the corporate industrial jail complex. Um, and then, in that case, how is that how is that process applied? We don't have a good record of uh, social justice in terms of applying prison terms, in terms of uh, applying any of these interventions. So, uh, and then, do you are you applying it punitively, or do you have it? Are you doing it in a sense of actual constructive social progress? Um, if you have somebody who is profoundly depressed and suicidal and you have a treatment that will work, you know, has a 95% chance of curing that person, can their, can their family ha have them declared incompetent and force them to undergo it? There, I mean, there, there are so many, and these are things that might have benefit in the long run and, you know, they might thank you for it later, but our, um, our concept of personal autonomy is not actually based on, well, you'll thank me for it later, <laughs> unless we're talking about parenting. Um, so, so how much- I hope you have a child just like mine, <laughs> so you can suffer too. <laughs> exactly. So, so how, much, you know, how, how, much, how much parenting is society allowed to do to adult human beings um, <laughs> is, a, you know, is, a, is a really patent question. I don't know the answers to any of these, which is why I write fiction rather than essays. Um, but fiction is a, is a fantastic uh, space for thinking about the in, intended and unintended consequences of the intersection between biology and culture. Yeah. So I, I, universal literacy, read the story, um, besides the fact that uh, a whole lot of oppressive societies, especially female oppressive societies, would go away. There are some also some art forms that would probably also go away, mm -hmm. and there would be new clever ways of restricting access that states would impose, right? On authorities would impose. Even if you can read, we don't, you don't get access to certain websites, right? Which we know is already done. Uh, I was thinking though about a, uh, another uh, sort of bringing 
one aspect of neuroscience home to the two female science fiction writers I'm sitting next to. <laughs> I have to say, when I was a kid, I was a subscriber to the Science Fiction Book Club. I think I, I, it was almost exactly 50 years ago that I started that subscription. But who's counting? Uh, it was obviously prenatal. And uh, you know, I think I got six books for a penny, and it was Asimov and Heinlein and Philip K. Dick. And uh, you never wanted to say Dick. You want to say Philip K. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were no female science fiction writers when I was growing up. I think we talked about this last night. There were none. There, there, there well, were a few, didn't, but they, they wrote yeah, under initials. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, there were a couple of them who were EM or something like that. Yeah, right. So, but you didn't know, right? And years later, I realized that Mary Shelley, <laughs> right, uh, she started the first big science fiction movement. So, um, but so there's that thought that it's very interesting for me to be here with two science fiction writers who are, who are women. I also had another thought last night. One of my graduate students at Penn is a historian of science who's working on the fact that for the last 35 years or so, neuroscientists have been interested in the question whether there's a gendered brain. Are male and female brains different? And she's working on the development of this question among neuroscientists, right, as, as an as So a this historian. is not settled. Oh, it's uh, quite unsettled. It's a hu right. huge debate. Um, leads me to the question, do women write science fiction or think about the future differently from men? Not, not all women, of course. There's a big overlap. Right? Um, if it turned out that there was a gendered brain, which is unsettled, and if we could have a drug that could make me think more like a woman than a man, or maybe write, if I were a writer of science fiction, more like a woman than a man, could I take some of that stuff and, I, see it and, and write a story and see if it would be a little different? Hmm. I, I think that gender is a social construct, for one thing. In part, not entirely. Yeah, sure no, not right. entirely. In, in, in the 60s, you know, I was in, in for a long time, you know, the idea was that, uh, of course, everyone's brain is different. Okay, that's, that's one thing I'm coming to realize. Uh, and, and the other thing is that, you know, the thinking is that uh, everyone's brain is the same, male or female, and, um, and so what's this all about? So when more research started coming out saying that uh, female brains are, are probably different than male brains, which, which is usually code for not quite as good, uh, <laughs> You know, I was uh, a little bit irritated, and 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 this is an excuse to limit the uh, limit the education of women usually uh, in in uh, in various ways. But to get back to the question, when women became more visible, there were always women in science fiction, and I know this because I've had access to deep research on this for a book that uh, that I'm writing a conclusion to right now, uh, but. But they were written out by men. Sometimes, like Fred Pohl, who is married to three science fiction writers, uh, wow. at one point said, no, women weren't writing science fiction in those days, in, in the 40s, 50s. It's just strange, you know. It's like, oh, it all kind of dropped out of my mind what my wife was doing all that time. And uh, <laughs> but uh, because you know, I I really liked. That well, explains Fred. why there were three of them, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> 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 but when women became more visible in science fiction, say in the 70s, there was the uh, uh, the impression that women were destroying science fiction. Hmm. Uh, that they were not writing about science, that they were doing soft yeah. science fiction about psychological issues or something soft like issues, that. Yes, yeah. they're, they're not, you know, engineering, they're not physics, uh, you know, they're not rockets, they're, they're we're writing about human beings and relationships. So I, I think stylistically as a writer, that's what I tend to write about, but I was asked to write a story about space exploration last week, last year, and I and I thought, well, I don't know much about rockets. I I, I don't know uh, if uh, I'm going to do this. And then I thought, you know, I know a whole lot about rockets. I know a lot about Werner von Braun. I know a lot about the history of rockets, mm -hmm. and and things like that. So I, I went at it in that at that angle. But I will I will give it over to to Bear because we we are starting to have limited time. It's, um, I'm just going to say very quickly that the women have been writing science fiction all along, as you say, and, and in, a lot, in a lot of cases, we don't know the gender or race yeah. of early authors because they existed as a signature on a contract. Yeah. Um, well taken. Yeah, the, the, uh, the other thing is that um, 
I, what you're, uh, there's, a, there's so much social bias in how stories are read that it's almost impossible to tell right. objectively what's going on. Uh, Charlie Strauss and I can write stories with approximately the same amount of uh, romance and uh, hand wavium and crunchy scientific bits, but when I do it, it's spec fic, and when Charlie does it, it's hard science fiction. Um, we've both remarked on this because oh. we're, we're sort of at the same level, you know, w in, in where we're tackling the, the, si the amount of science in our social, social criticism. But he's a hard science fiction writer, and I'm only occasionally a hard science fiction writer, <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> Anecdata. <laughs> I think it's time for, for Q&A, so if you have questions. Um, and Anne went up first. You? There, he's pointing at you. I'm pointing at you. Oh. <laughs> You're looking like who, me? Thank you. Uh, hi, Kevin Bankston. Um, we've been focused on the on drugs most, but considering the audience and the panel, I wanted to also talk about computers. Um, common sci-fi trope and what will likely be a reality at some point, although you know when it exactly is unclear, is uh, brain-computer interfaces. Uh, however, if that technology is anything like, say, internet technology now, it will be riddled with insecurities, could be hacked, could be used to surveil you, could be in the hands of the wrong people used as a tool of social control. This has been talked a lot, a lot about in science fiction. Uh, I'd say most recently a plug for a science fiction writer, Ramez Nam, who's written a great series uh, about some uh, brain-computer interface technology and raises these issues. So I just wanted to ask the panel, uh, ethical or unethical, avoidable or inevitable, uh, if the technology had comparable security to the internet we have today, is that something we want to put in our brain? Um, thank you. I, yeah, the blue screen of death, you know? <laughs> <laughs> really sucks when you're driving a car. That's, the, um, yeah. the, the, it, it's a very well-made point, and we do have brain-computer interfaces, I mean direct brain-computer interfaces, um, not your kid sitting in the back seat with the iPad. Uh, <laughs> But um, you being used medically right now, things like um, deep brain stimulation and uh, some people who have what they call locked-in syndrome, um, who have been able to communicate using implants. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And in terms of, of prosthetics or uh, controlling really profound depression, we're having some su success with this stuff right now. Uh, I personally, think that anything that can be hacked will be hacked. But on the other hand, there are a lot of people who, are, who have worried about um, automobile computers being hacked and sabotaged. And it doesn't seem to be a real problem currently. So I don't know how much of that is paranoia and how much of it is uh, an abundance of caution. So we just approach it like a potential side effect, like with drugs. I don't know. They get hacked. That's his job. Uh, <laughs> Under the bus. <laughs> I think you know DBS for Parkinson's symptoms works well for some people for a while. Uh, the brain, usually the brain computer interface stuff is highly mediated. The few experiments there are, mm -hmm. it's EEG and TMS and the internet, much more mediated than your relationship to your iPhone. So uh, you know, it really cool in the laboratory, probably teaching us something about the, the brain. But uh, I'd have to see the device that was going to take us to the next step that you might have in mind. I haven't seen it yet. I, I w and I would think it would be an entirely new paradigm that it would be much more biological than what you're thinking of as being a computer right now. And, and, and it, you've distributed, uh, you know, throughout your body, perhaps. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one, of the, one of the easy images that come to mind, the, you know, the, the nanobots or whatever, wh which would actually be organic in your body, giving information about your health and, and uh, you know, what's going on, and uh, perhaps even uh, moving to... Uh, fix it in real time, um, but, but I, th I, think, I think to associate the issues that we experience with our phones and laptops with, uh, with intimate uh, devices that are, are in the body is uh, uh, technically a stretch and, and, a, and, a, and a, great, a great subject for science fiction. 
uh, because it's it's really it's a really cool idea and, and you know to think about those issues and to, to extrapolate what may or may not happen and how strange and weird is society will become. Um, in the blue, yep. I was interested in the phenomenon of body hacking. Some people are putting in implants themselves. Uh, one gentleman can feel electrical fields. That's a choice that he made. But how do you think that's going to change the human brain? And what are the ethics of that? Yeah, I'm a neuroskeptic about these things. I think it's really interesting. I think we'll. 10, 20 years from now, we're going to see this as kind of a blip on the screen. Whatever's going on now is, it's pretty cool. People have been doing this for a while. There's a, there's a, uh, a professor in the UK who's got a, a thing that lights up when he's near his wife, and you know, it's around her neck and so forth. Uh, it's very nice. I'm glad that works out for them. But uh, she's got a, you know, an implant uh, under her finger that broadcasts. Okay, it's great. But I think, I just don't, I don't see that as going, uh, that, I don't think that's the pathway to whatever's going to happen particularly. There are some artists doing some cool things. But that's not something, that's an innovation. That's not something that's going to be disseminated widely, I don't think. But uh, just a guess. Uh, I do think that implantable sensors for our, our physical condition uh, are going to be very tempting uh, within a, a decade or so. People are going to think that's great. It's like in my car. I can know what's going on in my car. I can know what's going on in my body all the time. Until people discover that there's very little they, they can actually do about their you know, medical problem, their deterioration with aging, for example. Not much, you can, not much intervention you can do with a lot of those things yet. So it's a lot easier to know what's going on than it is to actually do an do a intervention that is therapeutic. Well, and, and uh, are you going to trust iCloud with that data? <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, other, the other really salient question there. Oh, I was struck by somebody mentioned the typological, you know, the mistakes you make on the, on the keyboard, yeah. which it can be known. And clearly, over 30 years, I'm going to make a lot more mistakes than mm -hmm. I, you know, in the next 30 years, God willing, than I do now. So you're going to be able to maybe track dementia over a vast population if you do the data aggregation by seeing how many mistakes people make. I think there are people who are actually working on exactly that. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, body hacking, I think it's a, it's a bodily integrity issue. It's, it's your own business. Um, I don't see any, it's like getting your ears pierced. You, you get to decide if you're going to do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks a lot. I'd be interested for you to be more explicit about a, a sort of meta-level issue here. Of what do you think the role of science fiction should be in informing ethical and policy debates? Did you think about that much when you're writing your stories? One well, can almost imagine a world where, for any given policy or ethical issue, you try to commission a lot of science fiction that helps explore it from a variety of different perspectives. So, how would that work? Well, um, that's yeah. That, that <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to turn so my mic's in the right direction. Um, that's exactly what I see my job as, actually, is having ethical arguments with myself in public. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, um, at first I thought, well, this is, this is kind of odd because uh, I, don't, I, don't, I look at on literature as, as being, you know, entertainment, uh, basically. And, and uh, there was an editor who profoundly shaped science fiction in the 40s, John W. Campbell. Mm. Uh, and uh, he basically would, would tell the authors, like Heinlein, you know, what, he, what kind of idea he wanted them to develop in a story and, and how you should go about it. Uh, and, but there was not any of that, you know, with this anthology. I, you know, I was free to choose my own idea. I was free to, uh, to develop it in my own way. And, and I think that it is something that science fiction writers think about profoundly all the time. So usually the issue for me is how to not be uh, preachy, mm -hmm. you know, how, how, to, how to let it seem like a real story with a real protagonist, with real issues, uh, how to frame it so that it, that it works as literature as well as... Uh, information, uh, a, a set of possibilities. Uh, a set of possibilities is what science fiction is usually about. So that's the way I approached it. And uh, I, I think, you know, from all the stories that I've read in the anthology, that, that that's pretty much how, how it turned out. We have time for one more question, so. Uh, 
back there. So I'm wondering to the extent um, that you've thought about sort of scientific positivity, uh, positivism here. So many of the things that you've been talking about in terms of homosexuality being persecuted as a psychiatric disease or uh, women being treated with hysteria for hysteria using Valium are things that the more we know about the brain, the less likely we are to make those sort of errors because there's no empirical basis for them. So I'm wondering if you can discuss that a bit. Uh, you know, I think it was social change rather than neuroscience that resulted in the, in the changed attitudes that you just mentioned. Uh, so I don't know if there's anything hard, about hard neuroscience that led us in, in, in the direction of having better, more appropriate attitudes toward, uh, toward those populations. Um, in fact, I think the jury is out about how neuroscience is going to uh, help us or, or make it more complicated dealing with, for example, violent offenders. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big problem because if it does turn out that there are actual, uh, me, uh, some of my colleagues think that there are some actual me identifiable metrics uh, the kid who starts to pull the leaves off the fly, you know, when he's six years old, is going to progress to actually beating up the disabled kid on the playground at age 16. Some people think that you're going to actually be able to see that uh, when the kid is younger than six even. And if that's true, then what kind of intervention would be appropriate and, you know, what, how much could we require, again, for parents to do? Take them out of class, give them uh, special medication. Uh, so here we get into minority report kind of territory. I think that... I th so I don't think we've seen the neuroscience implications yet of dealing with uh, different kinds of, of, of ways of living. I think we will, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we don't, you know, as he says, I, I don't think that we know enough about the brain. Uh, in, we have the Brain Initiative now in the United States, which is great. Uh, and they're handing out money to different projects. Uh, I read about one today. Uh, and, uh, and then in Europe, they have their own uh, big, big brain project, or the, the, there's a blue brain project. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that this will yield a lot more usable information. And I, and I think that being uh, aware of, of this research, because research doesn't give you any technology, it's just information. So then, uh, you know, the way that technology goes is often uh, commercial. So, uh, you know, that will be one thing that we will have to, uh, to look out for. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 the, the, the more information we have, the more wisely we can use it. But I think that, you know, as information kind of dribbles in, it can be totally misinterpreted and used uh, in ways that are inappropriate, dangerous, unethical, uh, and, and the like. Yeah. Uh, as, uh as both of my esteemed colleagues have, have said, there's the, the, the danger of confirmation bias. Mm. Um, you, people will gravitate toward the research that seems to prove what they want to believe. And we, we pretty much all do this, even those of us who try to be self-aware about it. Um, and oppressive systems are the most reinforcing of confirmation, confirmation confirmation bias because their oppression reinforces their, their power. Um, as uh, Kathleen was sorry talking earlier about, um, well, all the things about female brains being different seem to say that they're not quite as good. That's, so there is a danger there as well. And, and I will quickly add that uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the uh, 70s, or was it the 60s, uh, well, I think it was in the 70s. Nixon had a an all, all gold star panel of physicians uh, evaluate marijuana and to see if it was a bad and dangerous drug. Well, it was to him because he he blamed it partly on all of these uh, young people uh, causing a revolution, and um, uh, so he ignored all of that information and had marijuana scheduled as a Schedule I drug. No research has been done in the United States on its properties in, in uh, you know, human neuroscience, the rest of the body, since then. And so there's also politics to consider. And with that, I think we're done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.